Please remain standing in body or in spirit for today's scripture lesson from the Gospel according to Luke. Listen for the word of God. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but in the end will not follow. The end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against a nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and siblings, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Debbie, for that wonderful reading of the gospel lesson, and please be seated, everyone. Good morning, Christ Church family and friends. What a joy it is to be with you this morning, whether you're here in person or if you're joining us online, we're glad that you're with us as well. Uh, of course, I've been gone for uh, a few days. I was gone over last weekend, and I just want to thank you. I want to thank our staff for making that possible. I uh, especially want to thank uh, Pastor Leanne also for offering such a fine sermon and filling the pulpit in such a gracious and fine manner. Uh, I realized this morning in the early service and here just again as we gathered that when I'm away, I'm not fully home until I'm here in worship with you, and it's good to be back. I just want to say that. Well, friends, as we continue in worship, let's join our hearts in prayers. Loving God, we thank you again for this day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this time in worship and all that you've already had for us, how you've spoken to our hearts through music and song, through prayer and silence, and now through your word. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes and our ears, our hearts, our minds to everything that you've already had for us and, and what you're going to have for us in the next few minutes. As always, O oh God, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Unsettling things can settle us in our faith. I'll say it again, unsettling things sometimes can settle us in our faith. Most of you know uh, last week that I faced an unsettling situation. I'd been training for months and months for Ironman Florida, and there I was last week training for the race, this last-minute preparations, and something happened that was unsettling for me, and it was the ocean. You see, they don't have an ocean here in Louisville, Kentucky, so I don't get to swim in it regularly. And the ocean last week around Panama City Beach was being very oceany. And what I mean by being oceany is that there were waves, kind of big ones. There was current, a strong one. So undaunted by that, the way you overcome that concern is you just you get used to it and you swim in it. And I did some practice swims, and unfortunately, the day before the race, I realized that because I was pulling harder and swimming harder I, in rougher seas, that I injured my left shoulder. And I had a rough time. By the night before the race was to happen, I was in a lot of pain. My hand had gone numb. 
my fingers were tingling like they were asleep and were trying to wake up again. I couldn't move my arm right. I agonized over it. I prayed over it. Kathy and I talked about it the morning of, and I had this sense that I just really wanted to be led by the Spirit of God in what I was to do. Ultimately, I decided through a lot of prayer and, and also stubbornness, I mean determination, uh, that I was going to get in the water and I was going to swim that day and I was going to do that race. And I, I remember going down to transition and getting into my, my wetsuit and the agony of just getting into my wetsuit. And I, I remember asking God, and if you're connected to me on social media, you've seen the video, but I kept asking God, what should my next step be? And I kept having this overwhelming sense, not a voice, but a sense, trust me, you'll see. Well, should I even go to the beach? Trust me, you'll see. I was there at the arch, ready for it to start for me. And what should I do? Trust me, you'll see. The tone beeped. We bounded into the water. It was so thrilling in that moment, I must say. But I wasn't into my swim more than a couple of hundred meters when I realized that my shoulder just wasn't going to work that day. My best and my hardest wasn't enough that day and in that moment. Oh, I kept trying to swim with one arm in the current and the seas that were about three foot swells that day. Somebody came up to me and one of the safety people and they said, well, are you, are you okay? You look, you know, do you need to get out of the water? Uh, I'm fine. I, I lied. I mean, I was determined. I, I, I'm fine. Thank you. And I kept at it and kept at it. And, but in the midst of that, I experienced something, well, troubling. I'm in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> and I was pulled by the current away from other people. And if you've ever been in the ocean, when it's being oceany, you know that there's troughs and there's crests of the wave. And when I was in the trough, I realized that all I could see around me was water. Couldn't see anyone else, hear anyone else. Couldn't see the safety personnel. Couldn't see the, the Doritos or, you know, the big buoys that you sight on. It was just me in the water. And I have to tell you that in the midst of all of that, where I expected to feel great panic and fear, where I came to the end of myself, I found something amazing there. I found peace, and I found that God was right there waiting for me. I did have to leave the water that day, but I left the water with a certain amount of peace, and I still felt God saying something to me like, trust me, you'll see. I was settled in my faith. More about that in a few minutes. Because I mentioned that. I mentioned this idea about, about being settled in our faith in an unsettling situation or an unsettling moment or an unsettled future or time because that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in the gospel lesson today. I mean, in case you missed it, he's with his disciples, and they're in Jerusalem, and they're right there at the temple, which was a marvel of the ancient world. It would be a marvel of the modern world if it were still standing. Have you ever had that moment when you are when you're walking next to a large building or some kind of human-made structure, and it's just amazing? Have you ever had that moment looking at a tall skyscraper, or maybe you're in Washington or someplace where you just see this building, and maybe you've done like me, you kind of reached out and you touched the columns, and you just have to touch it and, and feel it and just somehow experience the weight of it, the gravity of it, and, and you say or think to yourself something like, how do people make things like this? How is that even possible? Well, that's what the disciples would have been thinking when they were at the temple. It was an architectural marvel. It was an engineering feat. It was an artistic thing of beauty, not to mention the religious significance of it. And as they were having that moment, how do people, how did Herod do it? How did Herod make this? How, how did he move these enormous stones in the middle of that marveling at this wonderful structure, that's when Jesus lowers the boom on them. Oh, you see this? Sitting on 35 acres, it's all going to be rubble in just a few years. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Herod, who wanted to build something that would, that would outlast him and would make his mark into generations to come, well, it didn't last past the next generation after him. 
because the Romans came in, they beat down a rebellion, and they leveled the temple. And it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that that was unsettling. Jesus was painting a very unsettled view of their future. He talked about wars. He talked about insurrections. He talked about a time when nation would rise against nation, kingdom would rise against kingdom. He talked about a time when there would be plagues and famine. He talked about a time when there would be betrayal. Not just strangers betraying you, but your family, siblings, parents betraying you. He talked about a time when, well, you would not only be betrayed, but you would be arrested. You would be put before councils and governors and, and, uh, and governmental officials, and you would be hated, he said, because of my name. You would be persecuted. And if all that wasn't unsettling enough, he even went so far as to say, oh, and by the way, some of you will be put to death because of me. That's a pretty unsettling view of the future. And let it not be lost on us that as we look in Scripture, and if you turn your Bible just a page or two into the future in Luke's gospel, this is not some far-off reality for Jesus, this idea of being betrayed this idea of standing in front of a governor, this idea of being put to death. We can see that in just a couple of chapters in Luke's telling of the story that this is about to happen. Jesus, of course, was betrayed by his friend Judas. He did stand before the governor. He was put on trial, and he was, a very short time from him telling this, going to be hanging on a cross, bleeding, gasping for breath, and dying. That's the future that Jesus was pointing to and was very soon to live into. So why in the world is Jesus telling them this? What's Jesus trying to do here? Is he trying to throw a, a pity party or something? No, quite the opposite. When you really consider what Jesus is doing here, he's not throwing a pity party. He's giving a pep talk. What Jesus is really doing here, he's trying to build hope, and he's trying to build faith and endurance into his disciples because he knows that they're going to have an unsettled future. He knows that they're going to have difficult times, and he's preparing them for just that kind of a future. I, I want to just lift up for us in today's message three unsettling truths that settle us in our faith that are very clear in the gospel lesson. And the first one is this. Anytime we stand with and walk with and for Jesus, it necessarily means we're standing against something else. And sometimes the world around us isn't going to like it. We see that in the life of Jesus. I mean, as soon as he begins his public ministry, as soon as he opens his mouth, as soon as he starts teaching, as soon as he starts healing people, as soon as he starts doing anything, remember what happened? The religious officials took note of his day the Pharisees, they came out. They wanted to hear what this upstart preacher was talking about. And when Jesus started reinterpreting the law as they were interpreting it, when he began framing it around himself as one who had come in to usher in the very kingdom of God, when Jesus started doing things that they didn't think he should be doing, like healing people on the Sabbath, that's when they began to plot to kill Jesus. And the same thing was to happen with the disciples. As they walked in his way, as they, as they continued in his word, they began to have opposition because it was challenging the current religious establishment of the day, and they faced persecution after his death and resurrection. Same thing happened with Rome. Not that those who followed after Jesus were trying to actively undermine Caesar or Rome itself, but they found out pretty quickly that they didn't see Caesar as God. They saw Christ as the Son of God and saw God as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the kingdom that they were worried about wasn't a kingdom that somehow revolved around Rome, but it was a kingdom that God had brought forth and was continuing and continuing to bring forth the kingdom of heaven that has earthly implications. And Christians, followers of Jesus, were persecuted by that. To walk with to stand with Jesus is to stand against other things in our world. 
You know, we just had a uh, political cycle. Anybody missing the phone calls, the full mailboxes, and the TV commercials and radio? Raise your hand if you're tired of all of it. I mean, sorry, if you miss any of that. I'm not missing any uh, of that right now. But something interesting happens in every political cycle. Uh, the, The victors and those who are defeated stand up and they make nice speeches. They say something like, I want to commend my opponent on the spirited campaign uh, that they waged, and now we are going to put our differences aside, and we're going to work together for the good of our community, region, or nation. Have you noticed how they they do that? And and it seems like they behave themselves for about seven and a half minutes, and then everything returns to the way it had been. The sharp division, the demonization, the marginalization of others. We live in a world where… We all say, and, and I think we say it, I think we say it earnestly, where we want to see more unity and less division. We want to see more of a coming together around the right things. The passage today reminds us that the thing that we can come together around as followers of Christ is Jesus. Amen? And when we do that, though, it means that we're opposed to something, to something else, And we're kind of given a clue as to what that is when I remind you of our baptismal vows. What would we stand against? Well, the spiritual forces of wickedness, the evil powers of this world, and we also vow to repent of our own sin. What else do we stand against? Well, evil and uh, injustice and oppression in all the forms that they present themselves. That's right out of our ritual, right out of our baptismal vows. And Well, that's the unsettling truth, that we may always feel that tension, that we may always be in some kind of a conflict with a culture that in some ways will always be broken and counter to the values of Christ. That's our reality in this world. But Jesus says something very interesting. When he talks to them about how they will be arrested and put put in front of governors and officials, he said, make up your minds right now not to plan a defense for yourself, not to make that up in advance. I find that very interesting that Jesus said that. I have some ideas about why he said that to them. It it might have been because of our tendency, if we were to sit down and make up a defense of ourselves, it, it might have more to do with just proving ourselves right and other people wrong than anything to do with God. But I think the key to what Jesus was really getting at there was lie in what he was saying, that I, I, will, I will tell you what to say. <laughs> he, he's talking about being in one of those situations that's so unsettled and so out of control that we have to lean so fully into God and to trust God and to experience God meeting us in that place and literally giving them the words that they would say. It's that idea that Jesus said. It gives you an opportunity in the tension of that moment, even though we as modern-day followers of Christ will very unlikely face those exact kinds of situations. We will be in this world that is broken just as we are broken, but we'll be in it as people of faith, and we'll have opportunities to testify, not testify necessarily to just what we think is right or wrong, but to testify to the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the settling truth in an unsettled reality. That's the settling of our faith in those situations. But another unsettling truth in all of this, or an unsettling thing about this passage, is that it reminds us that so much of what we take comfort in, so much of what we have safety, what we, what we experience safety in, is temporary in this life and temporary in this world. Think about the things that bring us comfort and a sense of safety, good things, things like savings accounts and retirement accounts, things like careers that are fulfilling for us and jobs that we like, the houses that we live in, the cars that we drive, the clothes that we wear. Think about it, the buildings that we're in, even this building, the homes, again, that we live in, buildings as strong as they are may even last for centuries. They're not going to last forever. Or temporary. The temple reminds us of this. It wasn't just the architecture. It wasn't just the engineering that was so important about the temple. It's what it represented to the people of that time. People would come and offer sacrifice at the temple. 
people would come and they would uh, do the Passover festival at the temple. Related to that, but even more important than that, is that the temple represented people's access to God. And the idea of that being in ruin, rubble, would have been jarring for them. How could something so magnificent, how could something so solidly built not be permanent? How could something that was built to represent the presence of God not somehow last forever? That's the unsettled truth. Even the temple was much more temporary than Herod or anybody could have imagined when it was built. Well, what's the settling in of our faith in that reality? It's that when we come to the end of everything that's temporary, when we reach out to what is eternal, that's where we meet Christ. That's where we meet Jesus. And He takes us by the hand, and He leads us and loves us in that place. It teaches us when we think about even the the good things that are temporary, that even if all of those things are taken away from us, when we find ourselves in Christ, we are still blessed, and we are still well. Even the bodies that we have, they are not permanent, of course. They will grow old, or they will get sick, they will falter, and they will fail us. But even in the temporary nature of that, we have the promise of God's grace and love which carries us to eternity, and even the promise of resurrection. That's where we are settled in our faith, in the temporary nature of almost everything that is around us. And the third and final unsettling truth that we see that settles us in our faith, it has to do with the future. Jesus is talking about the future, and any time we talk about the future, any time we talk about end times, it gets people's attention, right? Sometimes it gets a lot of attention. Was it back in 2012? Was that the last time somebody made a big deal about the end of the world? And I think Hollywood even got on board and made a movie about it. And well, when Jesus talked about the temple being destroyed, and in this section of Luke's gospel, talking about the end of times, it got people's attention. But, but I believe as I, as I read this chapter of Luke that Jesus wasn't so much as trying to tell us exactly what would be happening in the future as Jesus was telling us who holds the future. Because when we get straight about that, who holds our future, that it's God in Christ that's holding our future, that's when we have the assurance that our every moment is being held by God. And when we really believe that, when we really experience that, that's when everything begins to change for us. That's when we are settled into our faith in a way that is beautiful, in a way that is powerful, in a way that continues to lead us forward. Back to the water last week and, and what, what happened as a result of that. I, uh, I, I left the, the water that day. I really didn't, I really didn't have a choice. Um, I, the, the, the guy that saw me struggling, he, he, he saw me, and he wasn't going to unsee me after that. And so he kind of hung around and kept coming back to me. And I, I left with a great deal of regret, left the water, but I also left with a lot of peace because of what had just happened in the quietness of that ocean. I discovered a peace that was beyond myself. And I came out of the water, and I was so disappointed. wasn't really sure what to think or what to feel. And what I realized in the coming hours is that I had prepared for everything that day. I had trained countless hours, countless miles, uh, countless hours in the pool in open water swimming. Uh, I I knew exactly uh, what I was going to wear and when I was going to wear it and exactly how to get into transition areas and how to leave transitional areas. Uh, I knew exactly what kind of nutrition that was going to be on my bike and with me on the run. I knew exactly what kind of effort I was going to expend every single hour of that race and exactly the type and the amount of nutrition that I was going to put into my body at every point during that time. The one thing, the one and only thing that I did not prepare for was to not finish. That took me by surprise. But what I discovered on a day when my very hardest and my best just wasn't enough 
what I discovered when I came to the end of myself again. I discovered the grace and the presence and the power of God. I didn't have the day that I planned for that day. But guess what? My shoulder is going to heal. There will be other races for me to participate in if I choose to do so. And yeah, y'all, yeah, y'all, know, y'all know where this is going. And uh, I'll never have the opportunity to spend the day in the evening that I had as a cheerleader instead of a participant. To pray with people who were struggling in the race. To encourage and ensure family of first-time Ironman participants. To pray with a friend he was struggling in the middle of the marathon portion. To encourage and to cheer and to serve those who were serving as volunteers. Most of those people, almost all of them, but maybe one, I will never encounter again on this side of eternity. God gave me an opportunity to serve and pour out love on them. You know, you don't have to be in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of an Ironman triathlon, trying to swim with one arm to come to the end of yourself. You can be in the midst of life, and you can lose a loved one, or you can be experiencing trouble in your marriage. Or your career can be coming to an end, or you can lose your health, or all matter of things can happen in our lives, and they do. And that's when we find ourselves in that unsettled place. But friends, if you're anything like me, if you're anything like what Jesus is talking about and teaching to his disciples here, it's when we come to that place, when we trust God, we realize that in that place, Jesus is waiting right there for us. And will take us by the hand. And he promises us, not a hair of your head, not a hair on your head, will be harmed. That by your endurance, you will gain your lives. Friends, hang in there in those unsettled places. God is with you. Keep swimming. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For our invitation to Christian discipleship today, I want you to know that we have an amazing mission here, and it's about becoming living proof of God's love one person at a time. And we're about that mission in countless ways, through the ministries of this church here at Brownsboro Road, all the way to the West End, to other efforts that we support, through how our individual members are fulfilling that mission in their lives every single day. And I want to invite you more fully to be a part of that mission right here and now. I tell people all the time when they're asking me about the church and we're talking about the church and this wonderful church and this powerful mission that we have, that if I were a civilian, this is the place I would be. You're a wonderful church, and we're very serious and very intentional about this mission of becoming living proof. I want to invite you to prayerfully consider joining us in this mission.